Welcome to the AIPM Victorian Chapter YouTube channel. My name is Daniela Kellett and I am the President of the Victorian Chapter. And today I will be interviewing Paul Boudreau, Professor, Speaker, Author, Project Manager and Principal at Stone Meadow Consulting. Hello, Paul, and thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm really excited to talk about you know, how artificial intelligence can and should be used in project management and is being implemented uh, in organizations. Fantastic. So, Paul, I'm going to start off with our first question. What progress are we making with AI and machine learning um, and its uses in project management domain? And are you seeing some variances in the interest and adoption across various continents? Yeah, well, let me start off. Um, at, AI and machine learning, natural language processing, the main components are being adopted by organizations. Uh, it's, it's slow progress because it's a, there's a learning curve to it, but organizations are excited to get going on this. There's, there's value to it, there's a business case, and they see uh, implementing this as an opportunity to improve project success and project performance. In terms of geographically, I'd have to say that Europe is uh, the most advanced right now. Uh, the UK, uh, France, uh, Italy, Switzerland. Uh, I've done uh, work with people in Germany and I did a presentation uh, to the Netherlands um, a couple of weeks ago. So a lot of interest, a lot of software development being done in this area that can be used for, for implementing AI and project management. Um, in North America, Canada, we have a, a, a couple. Of course, I'm in Canada. Uh, United States, I'm not too sure what's going on. There's not a lot of activity. Uh, United States is the leader in AI development outside, you know, in general, but in terms of project management, it just hasn't kind of caught on yet, and I'm not sure why. And, and I want to mention Australia, too, because I think Australia is not too far behind Europe. Uh, I have a good friend, uh, David Porter, and his business partner, Kwong, who... Um, have a, a company called Octant AI and absolutely brilliant development. I encourage people to um, you know, check them out. And I believe that David is going to be one of your speakers um, as well at yeah. this conference. So definitely, definitely check him out. A friend of mine really understands what's going on in the environment. There is another um, organization called, I think it's Project AI out of um, Perth, Australia, the West Coast. I uh, don't know too much about them, but I understand they do uh, data connections and some predictive analytics and data insights for project management. And um, the other thing I wanna mention is, is, yes, it's good that you have software development, it's good that you have organizations that are, are trying to adopt these practices, uh, but also I've uh, you know, interacted with some students at um, RMIT. Now, help me with this, that's the Royal Military, Royal Melbourne Institute Royal of Technology. Melbourne, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, you've got academics and students doing theses on it as well. So I think it's a great opportunity and, and good for Australia. Fantastic. And just going back to another component of that question, we talked about the variances across the different continents. Why do you think it is that in the US, they don't have as much of an interest in, in using AI and machine learning in the project management domain? I mean, is it is it something cultural? That's a good question. Uh, you know, there's more awareness in Europe. Uh, there's more desire for change. Uh, there's a culture that seems to be more receptive to it. And United States, I'm not sure whether it's the big entities like Facebook and Amazon that have kind of uh, maybe put a bit of um, fear or, or reluctance in people. But um, outside of the US, uh, there certainly is the desire to, to and ambition to move forward in this area. When we talk about, because I know you talk about this quite a lot in your book and it, and it was really resonating with me, you talked about whether this was a people problem that we're trying to solve or a process problem that we're trying to solve. <laughs> um, and I found that really interesting. So from that perspective, you talk about the fact that certain continents like the UK and so forth and Australia are really interested in wanting to see change in this area. And I know that in the book, you also talk about the fact that machine learning and AI will lead us to find better process methodology at some point. It will naturally evolve through the application of that um, software. So do you think- Absolutely. That, do you think that in those countries, that, you know, you talked about we want to solve this problem. Is the problem that the methodology 
is not applied correctly or it just doesn't suit us anymore, it doesn't serve us in our VUCA world, what is it? Uh, I'm not sure, but I know that with, with uh, AI technology, one of the most important things when you're talking about either methodology or people as a problem, uh, the, the solution is collaboration. So perhaps there's just less collaboration in the United States and it's more entrepreneurial and more individual focused, right? Okay. But uh, Europe, Australia, it's about collaboration and working with people. So you want to implement a change in your methodology and you want project managers to make that change work. And that's kind of where I was going with trying to get across that point. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. So I know that data collection and integrity um, are proving to be real barriers to entry um, for this particular, you know, capability. So what, um, you know, what is really the problem there? Is it about data accuracy? Is it about shared data, sharing of values? Is it about truth, fear, data culture? What's really impacting us? Well, there's two things. I'll, I'll break this down by talking about two things. The first one is this concept of, of big data. And you've heard of big data. Oh, AI needs big data. And I think there's this reluctance to get involved with it because people think they need, oh, oceans of data, right? And that's simply not true. Um, for uh, supervised learning, when you're using machine learning, you, you do need uh, an amount of historical data. But studies have come out saying the amount of data you need in a business environment, like a project environment, is not as extensive as you would need, for example, in a medical environment. In a medical environment, if you're trying to diagnose an x-ray to see if there's pneumonia or diagnose a brain scan, then yes, I would think you need a lot of data sets to, to um, come up with a model and make a predictive, um, come up with a probability of what the diagnosis is. But in business, we don't need that much data. And I've seen it, I don't know if I put it in the book or not, but um, some studies say as few as 50 data sets. And I've even seen this come out of a professor in the States uh, yesterday saying as few as 50 data sets might be good enough as long as the data is relevant, accurate. And so now it's more about in project management, it seems to be more about getting relevant data, the right data, instead of massive amounts of data. Now, having said that, there's another aspect there's unsupervised learning, which you don't need massive amounts of data. So one of the processes I use is I take uh, tasks in a project. I can take 200 or 2000 tasks and I use my software program and I, I group them by complexity, technical, technical complexity of these tasks. And the purpose is for project managers to see, well, I've got 80% um, uh, technically difficult tasks or I've got 20% uh, technically difficult tasks. And then you can kind of match your resources. Are my resources up you know, to this standard? And the other thing is natural language processing. Natural language processing can take scope documents and just go through and analyze them and give you cost and schedule estimates based on the words that are being used and, and the type of requirements in that scope document. So this concept of big data, I think has confused people. It's misinterpreted, misunderstood. The second reason, that's number one. Number two is um, the problem is human inconsistency. And, you know, people are just so subjective. And yes, we are. <laughs> and I'll frame it this way. Uh, think of a project team. Uh, you're a project manager. On your project team, you have, I don't know, 15 or 20 people. And they're sending you emails. And so uh, they send you an email. The first email you get is like project A, whatever your project name is, uh, status update. The next person sends you an email, says um, project information. Another person um, sends you an email, project status. Another person sends an email, says info and the title line. So now you've got all these emails. They're not categorized. I mean, how do you go through and, and try and um, um, sort through them and, and you know, which ones are for status, which ones are for risks? Um, you know, how do I, you know, which ones have solutions, which ones have problems. So the problem is that we don't really have the consistency around data standards. Uh, people have talked about digitization and creating a really good data architecture, which is important for projects. But this, this concept of inconsistency and, you know, as humans, I don't know that we want to be put into that structure um, 
but we have to figure out something because what we have now needs to improve. So that's the two part. That's the data culture and the fear is the second part. Okay. Yeah, I think you make a really good point. And, and one of the reasons why I've been really happy with the evolution of project management over the last couple of years is because people are moving to these project systems. Now, obviously, there is a massive variation in the complexity of those systems. Some of them are oversimplified. Some of them are overcomplicated. However, I like the fact that we are starting to collect data with more consistency. And I think that's what those systems do for us. And that is the natural tipping point for when then yes. you'll be able to download all of that data and do something meaningful with it. So, you know, there is, I can definitely see that we are on the right trajectory. But I loved what you said in your book about the incompleteness of data being one of the issues. And you just sort of touched on it there where, you know, I was, you're talking about risk registers and it really came home to me. A lot of the time we write a risk, we suggest who is responsible for that risk. We put in a mitigation strategy for that risk, but we don't actually close it out. We don't actually yeah. say it was resolved and it was That's resolved correct. successfully using this strategy. That's and as correct. a result, you know, we need to be a little bit more structured and complete in the data that we collect. And it's it's very typical, like as an example, once I've deployed a project, how often do you actually go back and say, okay, I'm gonna check off all my project closure items and actually mark them as complete and mark this as the final version of my plan. It's just little things like that, yeah. that you know we really need to do better on, I think, in order to maximize the value of that data. Absolutely, and, and you're right. This is the, the beginning because um, when you're closing a project or what I would like to see is instead of lessons learned, we have kind of a process where we do data capture at various stages through the project. In other words, you might finish if your project has a gating process or a design stage or whatever phase it's in, you finish one of those stages and you say, did I collect all the right data that I need to have for my project at this stage? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then you know, make an adjustment as you move on, right? But that is, that is going to spearhead things. I have a... Um, I have another friend here in Canada who started a company on AI machine learning, uh, brilliant programmers, and he was working in the construction industry. But what he discovered is that the, the company had no way of, of capturing and collecting all their data. So he kind of re-vectored the company because as you said, that's the beginning of it. And once you have all that data, then you can start getting all this incredible value from it. And that's also why I say, um, organizations need to start early. Don't wait, right? Because you're going to be behind everyone else. Everyone who's going to be the most competitive in project management are going to be the ones who started early, realized what data they needed and didn't have, and made those adjustments as they moved along. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I like about what you were saying as well, and this actually came up in one of your other interviews, it doesn't all need to be systemized. It, you can use your Word documents, your Excel trackers, all those yes. kinds of things and derive value from those pieces. The concept, I mean, even though I've talked about, you know, systemizing data through digital platforms, it, that's not absolutely necessary. The machine learning algorithms that you had on your website, you can happily transpose all that through Excel. Yes. 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 And natural language processing can pull out the data and populate um, some of the some of the data fields. I mean, as I, I used to say in, in one of my talks, I would go through about capturing data and I'd say, and where does everybody keep their rest register? Easy to update, easy to understand, easy to present. It's in PowerPoint, of course. Yes. So <laughs> we use tools that are easy for us. Um, it would be nice to have it uh, captured, but tools are available to do some transitions or transformation for that data. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Uh, can I ask you another question just before we move on from this topic? But um, I was talking to a gentleman recently from a large Australian organisation and he was saying, you know, and I was saying to him, we're talking about all these topics. And I said to him, you know, you guys should be perfectly positioned to be able to use AI and machine learning across your organisation. And he said, no, we can't because we all use a different method, even though we all use the same tool. And I, I <laughs> pondered that comment and I didn't know, is he right or is he wrong? What's your thought? 
Yeah, so he's probably right. So here's the thing, and I and I use this example with uh, uh, something like scaled agile. And and anybody out there who's a scaled scaled agile advocate, I, I'm not saying anything bad. But the problem is you have a, a a process methodology template, and it's got I don't know 50, 60, 80 different components. And oh, you have to do this to be successful. You have to do this to be successful. And people don't. They just don't. And the studies that have come out has said most organizations are a hybrid. They use waterfall, they use agile, and they pick and choose what they want. So when you say that you know, people are using different methods, it doesn't surprise me because they can't do it all. A lot of it is redundant, but here's the key. If you use machine learning tools, it can actually tell you and identify which processes in your methodology are giving you the greatest success. Wow. So if you think about a process methodology that has 80 of them, okay, 20 of them are contributing nothing. You don't really need to do those, but you don't know it because everybody says, oh, no, we have to do it all. We have to do it all. And it, and it can be customized. The, the, the great benefit of AI is not every organization has to be the same. It's not cookie cutter. Here's your methodology. Everybody go use it. We can customize it and say, here's the best methodology for your industry, project type, uh, project environment, whatever it might be. Then the next uh, organization we go to, it might be slightly different. But the machine learning tools can tell you what the correct answer is. Wow, that is a that is a big value add. Um, yep. All right, so what we talked about barriers to entry um, earlier, but now we're just going to talk about just generally. What do you see as being the biggest barriers for organisations wanting to adopt machine learning and project management? And I'll give you the example that I was talking to a lady from Deloitte's just recently, um, and she was saying that you know they um, they were talking to a lot of clients about things like chatbots. And I love the idea of using a chatbot in project management because of the framework issue. What tends to happen is that a project manager will come along and, and potentially write a project plan that is oversimplified for what they're actually doing. And they've not really considered what are the different documents that might be in the framework that could assist me in getting you know, more likely to achieve my success in my project. And I thought a chatbot would be great for this. You know, type in what framework elements do we have um, around how to do consequential impacts or, or, you know, appropriate risk management for complex projects. I don't know what it would be. I'm just making it up now. But, you know, I was just thinking to myself, there are real barriers. And she actually claimed that the barrier was more at the senior leadership level and their concern was that using chatbots would have a, a, a perception in the market about the way they treat their people or what was happening to their organisation. And therefore, even though they recognised that it would be good for them, they didn't want to make that change. So what are your thoughts on what the real barriers are? Wow, that's kind of a scary thing. I wonder if I should give a demo. We'll see. I know. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, I want to talk about the, the barriers in organisations. You know what? A higher up CEOs and CIOs, they know the buzzword AI and they're actually pushing to have it implemented. Um, it's more or less, I think the middle, the middle areas uh, seem to be better, have this fear. And the first, um, the first reason I think is just lack of awareness. Uh, lack of awareness, lack of knowledge of what AI can do for your project and your organization. And that's important because the people who buy into this and start down that road are going to be more competitive. So, you know, by the, by, by the end of this, by five or 10 years from now, organizations that, oh, no, it's not for me, they may get left behind, okay? Yeah. Um, the second thing I've had, and this is with one of the clients I'm working with uh, right now, and um, I've checked and I said, how are you moving along with, you know, machine learning, natural language processing tools? And they said, we're too busy. So project managers get very, very busy and there's no allocation of time to say, can we improve our current, our current methodology by bringing in a new technology? And that's all AI is. Listen, it's just another technology, you know, automation, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, internet of things, uh, anything like that. So blockchain is what I was trying to think of. It's just another technology. And we need to find a way to use it 
to, to make things better, to improve our project performance. And the final uh, barrier I, I can tell you about is what I see is what I call entrenched bias. An entrenched bias is someone who, uh, I don't know if they're certified in a project process or they believe uh, you know, fervently in a project process and they just don't wanna change. And that's difficult. So it is a change management process. And part of it, it's like any other change management process. The first thing you wanna do is just do training and education and understand the concepts. Now you, you talked about chatbots, so I don't know if I could uh, do a bit of a demo here. Do you see a, a use case for chatbots in project management? Oh, sure, hang on here. Let's see if this were, I, you know, it's tough to try technology. Um, it doesn't <laughs> always work live. It's a live demo, just let me give this. Alexa, is there any training in the scope document? Try it again. Background noise. Alexa, is there any training in the scope document? Alexa is not connecting today. <laughs> Can you cut this out? <laughs> connecting to the network. Yeah, Alexis, Alexis not connecting to the network. You know what that means? I've got other people in the household who are tying up. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but what I do is you can check on some of these things. I ask Alexa things like, you know, um, uh, there's tasks this week. Can I move them to next week? Where is there in training? Yes, there's training. People are, you know, um, available for training or people are, are registered for training. And what happens is it, it now opens up the communication world of project management. Um, you may have a 280 page scope document and do you want people to go through it, right? If you had a chatbot that was really well designed, then you could have all of your project staff asking certain specific questions. Now you could set it up so that, you know, some things they're, they're not allowed to um, access, but simple things like maybe training or um, milestones or, you know, certain design requirements. Yeah, why can't they have access to that? Absolutely. And I think even from a, a, a leadership perspective, because I know that a lot of the time I'm in governance meetings and I'm talking about projects and I don't have those documents open in front of me and I don't want to spend waste five minutes of everyone's time with me trawling through documents. Even for me to be able to ask pertinent questions of the plan of this, of the, you know, um, yes of the PMP, whatever it may be, in the moment, that is yes. really valuable. Um, uh, there, is an, there is an organization that does this out of the UK called Horizon PPM. They actually have an Alexa interface uh, and you can ask things about risk. What's the status of risks on the project and where are they? Um, I'm not sure if people are aware, but uh, there is an MS project chatbot interface using Siri. Right. Um, so you can actually work on your MS project plan using voice commands. Wow, I love it. I've written so it's, that it's about making it easier. It's about making it easier in terms of communication and managing. Um, and I think it ties in with if project managers are too busy, wouldn't this kind of help them out a little bit? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think it's great. And I think it just goes towards creating a bit more efficiency as well. Um, it is a very laborious task, you know, managing through projects the way that we do so today. And anything that helps us take away some of the manual labor, you know, and even, even then it's just about where's this document? Can I locate it? Is that the most recent version? You know, you talk a lot about version control in the book, um, which I think is really important too. <laughs> But it's about efficiency. Yeah, and contracts. If you're do if you're doing contracts, if you're a company that has large contracts, um, you know, legal contracts, do you want to go through them? Yeah. And what a chatbot does is it 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 takes your words, tries to understand what you're trying to say, uh, so it tries to figure out what the intent is, and then converts that based on the document to give you a response. Yeah. It's one of the areas I'm doing research on in terms of um, being able to ask questions. Like, uh, can I reduce my budget five by 5% and not have an impact on the schedule? And in the background, it goes through and churns what a normal project manager would do and looks at all the options. Yeah, it's amazing. All right, so moving on to the next question, consider accountability in project management. Um, does this play a part? And, and this actually came up as something that I was talking to Marcus about, and you know Marcus Glowis quite well. Um, yes, and I he was, 
Yeah, he was talking about the excuses that we hear, that this is the best thing we can do, um, you know, that Agile would be better for us rather than some other methodology, you know, whatever. What kind of uh, part does accountability play in all of this? Well, what part does accountability play? Uh, you mean from a project manager perspective? I suppose, yeah, I do mean from that perspective, but I also, you know, one of the things I find with, project management and especially when we talk about risks and issues and we talk about project sponsors right so we talk about the fact that in most project management methodologies we are taught that the project um, senior stakeholder SRO project sponsor product sponsor whatever you want to talk about whatever you don't want to label them they are yeah. ultimately accountable okay we yeah. are there to deliver something on their behalf we are the doer but they are ultimately accountable. And I, and I struggle with that concept as well. But I, I, Yeah, I struggle with it too. I do. But at the same time, what I tend to find is that there are many times where I sit through project governance meetings and board meetings where I sit there religiously with my risk management, you know, uh, with my risk register, and I'll say, these are all the risks. Someone needs to take accountability for them. And at the end of the day, 99% of the time, it's me that ends up taking accountability, <laughs> even though I really don't have the power to influence the way that my project sponsor does. Yeah. But the project sponsor is less likely to take on that accountability. So I, you know, I like to think that a big part of project management, and I have always believed that part of your success in project delivery is really about how accountable that yes. project manager behaves. Yeah. yeah, when I'm accountable, I will push to get an outcome. When I sit back and don't take accountability, things just start to fall between the cracks. And I wondered how will, will AI and machine learning help us in that front? Um, will it only help with creating accountability? Will it start to show that progressively over time, some sponsors may behave with less accountability, some project <laughs> managers behave with less accountability? Will it be able to give us insights into those things um, that could increase our success? Yeah, dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, analogies there. You got to be careful. So um, I, I believe that the project manager has to be accountable. Uh, project sponsors, yes, as well. But here's the thing. Um, projects provide value. We live in this business world. Um, there's been a business case created, right, for delivering this project. And so somehow we need to retain that value as the project is being executed. And machine learning tools can help us understand, do we still have that value? Is there a risk to that value? Um, what direction should we take to maybe increase the value? Or if the value is going down, then you know, how do we manage that? Listen, um, uh, studies say that project performance wasted, wasted project performance, wasted resources accounts for 11% of our of our uh, uh, project uh, budget and schedule it's just a waste so we need to be accountable and you know we can find the value in machine learning tools to help us deliver that value to the organization for me that's really really important point um and, and it's quite sad now because i mean some people used to say you know what's the uh, What's the purpose of a project? Like what's, what's project success mean? And people would say, well, we deliver the project scope. You know, it's on time, it's on budget. And if we do all that stuff, we've met our business case, we've delivered it. And now organizations are saying, well, it doesn't really have to be on schedule. It doesn't really have to be on the budget. We can mess around a bit with the scope, but as long as we deliver some value, that's good. And you know what? That's not good enough. That's not good enough. We have to have the best project performance, the most efficient project performance we can. This is what they're doing in the operating environment. This is what's being done in manufacturing and, and mining environments, okay? They try to optimize the efficiency of the operations. And what are we doing about projects? We're, we need this new technology to optimize the efficiency of our projects. So yes, getting back to your point, we can do all of the above. Right. If a project sponsor is being less accountable or communicating in a bad way, we have natural language processing tools that can pull that out and say, oops, you know, maybe something needs to be corrected here. We can do sentiment analysis, sentiment analysis where do it on a team basis. How's my project team feeling this week? 
Has sentiment gone down or up? I'm a big believer in trends. Okay, so you can have a you can have a, a data point, but then look at that data point. Are my risks getting getting more serious, more risky, or am I getting less less of a, an impact with my risks? All sorts of things like that are, are quite easy to pull out using natural language processing tools. Mm. And, and sometimes they can be used on their own and sometimes you can uh, use them in conjunction with machine learning. Uh, they're already out there. Microsoft Teams has a module that does it. Um, some of the tools like Slack and other tools already have that if you, if you want to use the module. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Um, so let's talk now about, and we were going to talk about this next, which is what is the definition of project success? What's the definition of value? Um, and why is that important to AI and machine learning use cases, um, which you do cover in your book, and it's very eloquent. <laughs> eloquent? Oh, thank you. I think it, I think it was I the, the about that. Yeah. That must be the PMO book when I talk about value. And I talk about, you know, even as we bring these AI tools in, it's not about just bringing a technology in. It's about making sure we understand why. What's the objective in the organization? And I worked with an organ a multi multinational conglomerate out of Germany, uh, 26 project management offices around the world. And, and they went through and said, okay, and they found their objective. Their, our biggest issue in projects is risk. So that's what they focus on. And they say, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to create a data strategy. We're going to uh, look at vendors that can help us um, you know, uh, do better with risk management. And so they build a business case, a business case to provide value for implementing AI. And I think that's very important. Um, we're in the business world, as I said before, and you know, we need to provide value. And AI needs to provide value. Some organizations are going to do it improperly. They're going to do it wrong. Uh, people say to me, um, what are the issues in implementation of AI technology? And I say, well, exactly the same as anything else, right? If you don't do a good uh, you know, analysis of why you need it, if you don't create a business case, if there's no buy-in from the stakeholders, you don't have a, a value statement, um, you know, uh, and, and, and if you just want to kind of tweak what you're doing now and not change anything, then yeah, those organizations aren't going to get a lot of benefit. Mm -hmm. But organizations who see this as a disruptive technology, who say, yeah, I don't care about the way I'm doing things now. I want to be able to do things much better. Then those are the organizations that'll take advantage of what mm -hmm. AI tools have to offer and they're going to get the greatest value. So let's go back. To the one thing that I often talk about is the concept of doing the right projects as well as doing them well. And I know that you talk a lot about the uses for machine learning in project selection as such. Which projects do we think are going to be most successful? So that's really looking at your portfolio register and saying, you know what, based upon certain criteria, it's more likely that these projects will do well. And then I thought to myself, would the same technology apply if we were to say this is our strategy and this is our register? and these projects most align. Do you think that there is a, 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 you know, an opportunity for machine learning in that space? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm working with somebody now. Um, uh, oh, I can't mention his name, but he is in Europe, <laughs> uh, out of Belgium. Um, and uh, we're doing some portfolio work. And yeah, exactly that, aligned to the strategy. And in his case, the the portfolio, he's talking about projects, not just before they begin, but as they're being executed, what value they're providing to the organization. And he wants to be able to go into an organization and say, listen, um, this organization has 80 projects. Um, what are the 10 that really are no longer providing the strategic value that we thought? And, you know, and what are the 10 that you know, are really doing better? And then it helps you make better decisions. And we're using, actually, we're using my predictor tool to do that. We're, we're, we're collecting the data and we've already gone through a first round of doing it. And it looks, uh, it looks quite good, actually. And so this is really interesting because I was thinking to myself this morning, so I've done those sort of, you know, activities where we have suggested a portfolio of projects to make some improvements across the business. We've suggested a, a prioritization framework for how you would decide as a leadership team which ones are the right projects to select and what order to put them into and then of course there's a whole heap of socialization that goes on 
And I thought to myself, there have been some organisations where that process in itself can take six months. And that is six months of lost time in actually yes. starting any project. And I thought, I wonder if we could use this and condense the first part of the process down to a couple of weeks or even a month and then do you know months worth of socialization just to validate and kick the tires and, and make sure that the stakeholders are in agreement yes. with what the outputs are but that saved me three to four yep. months worth of wasted time and it's it all is. about that efficiency it is and the efficiency not only that but there's two things i, I made note here so i didn't forget is the first thing is a human bias Whenever you talk about priorities for projects, um, it, it's not always about the numbers. <clears throat> oh, this is my project, or this is my pet project, yes. or hey, this is the project I wanted, so uh, <laughs> I want this. To so, and even if you're collecting data, you know the data can be collected in a biased way, the way it's entered or the way it's collected. Uh, and the second thing, in terms of this process using machine learning, the amount of data you have to consider. The whole point of machine learning is it can take many, many more data points than a human brain can conceive of and come up with correlations in the data. Uh, the predictor tool uses logistic regression. I mean, imagine using logistic regression when you've got you know, 80 projects and perhaps, I don't know, 200 different characteristics of those projects. Our human brain do doesn't see the correlations. Nice. But this can pull them out. And then I think most of the time we'll be uh, socializing it with saying, hey, here's what the results are. And, you know, I talked about collaboration. Do these results make sense? Yes. Um, you know, is there some data <clears throat> management work that we have to do? We call it feature engineering or, um, uh, yeah, data wrangling, different things with the data that, you know, you may have three data fields that mean the same thing. Okay, well, mm. that's not right. We need to fix this up and do that. So that's part of the process as I work with people. And another thing, I was reading an article yesterday um, about, you know, opportunities to fix AI projects that are not working, as in, you know, the project is heading towards failure. And, and one of the key elements that they pulled out was the concept of being able to explain what the algorithm is doing. And that that can sometimes be a real challenge for stakeholder groups that are managing through these kinds of projects. And it can actually cause them to lose faith in the project and the value that it's going to create. Have you experienced that? And, and do you have any advice for anybody that's putting uh, these projects in place? So no, I haven't experienced it because I train people on what the algorithm is doing. And uh, I have very clear slides, very clear explanations of how it works. Uh, the problem is the outcomes. The outcomes, people say, well, I thought it was going to say this, right? Human bias again. It's not bias. It's very, very objective. And with large amounts of data, um, people are concerned because my predictive tool is based on a neural network. It's deep learning, three-layer neural network. And so how does it how does it do all that logistic regression in, in changing weights and biases of all these data factors? Uh, the answer is, um, I can tell you, actually. So I have another software program called Genetic Algorithm. And what this genetic algorithm does is it goes in there and it pulls out. What I can do is if there are, I don't know, if there are 200 uh, different characteristics uh, of a project, I can pull out and say, OK, um, these are the 10 or 15 that are giving 80% of that result. Mm -hmm. So I know that's, a, that's a common, another common misunderstanding. Listen, it, it can be true. If you're, again, if you're in the medical field and you have um, you know, 2 million data sets and you have, I don't know, 500,000 data characteristics and somebody says, okay, um, here are the top uh, 300,000 or the top 200,000 data characteristics you need to focus on. Well, how are you going to focus on 300,000 data? It doesn't. So that is an issue. Yes. But that's nothing to do with project management. That's nothing to do with the business world. The business yeah. world can manage with um, a smaller number of data sets uh, and a, number, a smaller number of features. Maybe we need more. We haven't decided. We haven't sorted that out yet. Exactly. Part of my research is to go through and see that. You know, how many, how many data sets will be really effective? 300 data sets, uh, 100 data sets, 500 data sets. How much historical data do we need? And it's just for supervised learning where you're labeling data sets. It doesn't count. Uh, the other ones like the clustering and the grouping and, um, and reinforcement learning, they're, they're very easily explainable.
Wow. All right. So my next question, I was going to ask you about your book, um, but we've talked a lot about it. I think I've given people. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to say about the book before we move on to our question? Um, um, sure. So really, you know, I wrote my book. It's called The Self-Driving Project. And, you know, I talked about change management process and getting people to change their entrenched bias in project methodologies. So I wanted to grab people's attention. I, I, I really wanted to be controversial. And that's where you can grab somebody's attention. So in this book, what I propose is we don't need project managers. Here is a solution to uh, in project execution. In the project execution stage, I go through every step, every, every um, functional area and say, here's how this can be done without using a project manager. And guess what? You know, we make better decisions and we eliminate, we eliminate that human bias in decision making. So that's kind of what it's about. It's about being more proactive in project management. But let's come back to it a bit later too, and I'll talk about, you know, what I where I think, how I think project managers can use it. Not a problem. And just by the way, whilst we're still here, what's been the feedback to that concept? Uh, uh, people either love it or hate it. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Yeah. So, and, and, you, you, and again, it's based on, it's based on people who are there, you know, there are, are, are project champions. There are, you know, technology people who I've got to find a way to improve my project. And then there are the people who say, yeah, no, not, not here. It's not going to work. Don't believe yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So. so more love, more hate. Where, where are you sitting right now? <laughs> Yeah, slightly more love, I think, slightly. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I actually right. know this. I shouldn't say that because this week, uh, last week, uh, I, I discussed the, uh, I had a, a presentation to a oil company in the Middle East and uh, lots of love there for it. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the life cycle for AI development in project management in our industry. Where are we now? What stage are we at? You know what? We're, we're early stages. Um, you know, adoption is slow. And I think people are trying to wrap their heads around this, this data. How do I create a data strategy? What do I have to do first? And it's really awareness. It's about awareness. It's about, you know, knowledge. And how do I move on from here? How do I move on from here? Fantastic. Um, and what are you seeing as being the most important use case for AI and machine learning in project management and why? Oh, there, perfect question. Excellent question. Thank you for asking that. I'll give you three. I'll give you three, okay? Because I'm very opinionated on this one. Uh, the first one is what I call honesty and documentation. And, and I use the word honesty deliberately because you could say, well, Paul, what about accuracy? Well, to me, honesty means it's accurate and beyond. It's accurate and objective. So for example, again, think about the scope statement. You know. If you have natural language processing and you have an accurate, honest scope statement to start your project, and this scope statement might be 350 pages long. I've, I've worked with an organization that had one for, it's a high tech company in, um, in uh, the US that had a 280 page uh, scope document and they still, it was still a mess. <laughs> but get some of that consistency, understand how to estimate it properly, look for gaps and errors in it. And it's kind of funny because when I, when I teach, um, what I do is I take one of these scope documents and I tell my students, I say, okay, um, I give them the Word document. And I say, all right, look for training or uh, look for milestones and tell me if you see any inconsistencies. And of course, they'll go through, oh, yeah, look, these milestones are in the wrong order or this one has no due date or something. So that's what machine learning, that's what AI does, but it does it more comprehensively. So that's, for me, honesty and documentation was one of the really important uh, use cases. The next one, and one I'm going to start doing a lot of serious research on, is resource allocation. Yeah. And resource allocation, I'm talking about matching tasks to skills. So, you know, can we be more efficient? When we talk about poor, poor uh, project performance, let's talk about technical tasks and technical skills or even you know, skills and experience and ability to learn, maybe even team skills. 
So which part of my project needs the most technical skills and matching those resources to the right tasks. And if you think about a portfolio, right? Many projects in a portfolio, this becomes even more critical, okay? Yeah. Um, and the third area, of course, I would be remiss and you'd be disappointed if I didn't mention it, risk management. Yeah. Risk management. Now, I have a bit of a different view, and maybe you'll think it's controversial again, but I believe in something called binary risks. And if you think about it, when your project is finished, you've had your, you have your risk register from the start of the project. When your project is finished, those risks have either happened or they didn't happen. They're binary. So all of the risks in a project, they are binary. So why are we using 1980s technology? Oh, probability and impact. That's where you, I know, Daniela, I know you're using it, right? What's the probability that this is going to happen? And what's the impact? That's 1980s technology. We need to update it. So with machine learning tools, I want to get to more of a binary risk proposition where we say, yes, this risk is going to occur. Okay, then um, it has to go in the scope document or it has to be included in the budget or schedule or this risk is not going to occur. Now, I know we can't eliminate all the risks, okay? But what if I took your risk register of, of 80 risks and reduced it to 10? Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Now, how do I do this? How do I simulate this? How do I put this in terms of data? There's three aspects to risk data. The first one is the risk description itself. The second one is the, uh, what I call the project conditions. So what are the characteristics of the project that's going on in which this risk may or may not occur? And the third aspect is what I call the external environment. So what are the con conditions or characteristics in the external environment? And we can, we can calculate a lot of that. Are you having difficulty acquiring a certain skilled resource? Um, are, there, um, are you having difficulty with certain uh, regulations or getting permits or whatever it might be? Um, you know, what season is it? What time of year are you putting this project? So the external, and people forget about that. They just work strictly within their project and they do a risk description and forget about the other factors. And based on all those three areas, then we can work out um, what I call binary risks. Will this risk happen or will it not happen? Mm -hmm. And slowly move the methodology to something that's a bit more modern. Mm. And I kind of agree with you. I, I very much agree with the concept that you mentioned earlier, that the way we manage, monitor, the methods we use for risk management are extremely antiquated. And then another thing that I find very interesting about risk management is that when we assign these probabilities um, and consequences, it's extremely biased in itself because I have no data by which to validate those perceptions. They are perceptions either based on my level of experience or my understanding of the culture and the environment, right? And a lot of the time, risks that should be nominated are missed. You know, I, I was having a conversation with a, a senior project manager just recently, and he said, you know, I sat down with my project team and they had 60 risks on the risk register. By the end of the meeting, it was 140 risks, but we actually eliminated 30 other risks. So <laughs> it was really interesting that your level of um, experience can somehow dictate, but there is no data to validate that any of that is right. And even when we talked earlier about portfolio management, I mean, a lot of the time we, we try to understand what the risks are associated with those projects, even though they're still in their infancy. And what we don't understand about the resilience about the portfolio and the way we manage portfolios um, is that external factors play a massive part. You know, yes. we, if we think about what happened with organisations pre-COVID and when COVID was announced, a lot of organisations had to change their strategy because they were totally incapable, I suppose, of understanding how much this virus was going to affect their strategy at that point yep. in time. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I think very, very important that we do something about the way we manage risk. And I think you're right in that bringing in external data is very important. Um, so tell me more about the project agent, and I can't wait to hear more about <laughs> this, um, and the concept and why you feel that that technology will capture the interest of the industry. 
So uh, three aspects to the project agent. First of all, prevent. So I'll tell you the three, prevent, predict, and resolve. So prevent is um, why do we, and it gets back to what project managers are, are supposed to do. We're supposed to do planning and we're supposed to be great planners. Isn't that the most important stage of any project, the planning stage? And what do we do? Our project sponsor, well, your project sponsors that you mentioned, let's get started, let's get it going. Yes. Why don't I see people working, right? So, so we just want to get moving because people wanna see results. Um, what the project agent can do using machine learning tools is go through that planning stage in a much more, um, as I said, comprehensive process, but also do it a lot faster. Mm. Um, if it takes three months for a project manager to go through and do all that planning, what if we had a project agent that could do it in maybe three weeks or two weeks? You see, so now these people who are saying, get started, get started. Okay, yeah, we're gonna run this to get everything set and then we go. We want to prevent, minimize variance. We wanna prevent uh, obstacles before they occur in the project. And that planning stage is a very important point, a point, in, uh, point in the project to do it. The second one is predict. And this gets into all the machine learning. That's what it does is it predicts things that are gonna happen. Um, even though you can't see them, a project manager can't see them. Because if we can predict them, we have more time to figure out how to address them. Yes. Right? So you predict it, and then, <laughs> listen, I know project managers, what do they do? Uh, they fight fires, right? And I tell, I, I have to tell you this story. I feel so bad for project managers. I tell my students, I teach project management in a couple of uh, uh, colleges, universities, you poor people, here's what's gonna happen. Um, you're gonna get out in the project world. And because you've taken my course and because you know how I'm working, you're going to be the proactive people. And you're gonna be out there proactive, fixing things. And you know what? It's gonna look like you're not doing any work. And then there's gonna be the project manager, your counterpart, okay? And all they're doing all day is putting out fires, managing conflict. And people are gonna say, wow, look at that project manager. Are they ever, are they ever busy? Are they ever active? What a great project manager they are. So we've got it wrong. We have to flip this, this script, right? And flip it around, okay? Predict obstacles before they occur and take that time to, to see what you can do about them. Hold your meetings, talk to people, get more technical resources and skills available. Then the final one um, is resolve. And what resolve means is make better decisions. Because we've talked about project managers being subjective. And, and people are subjective. Don't, don't do things based on a personal bias. Do them based on data. And I want to talk about this. So one of the things in the book, I said it's to eliminate project managers. The other way I would like project managers to look at this is they can go through the book and basically become uh, a pseudo AI project manager. And what I mean by that is they can start adopting these practices and policies without actually using any AI tools. Give you an example, start building a knowledge repository. We talked about this, issues. You have an issues register. Okay, here's the issue that happened in my project. Here's the description. Um, here's the project conditions. Here's what our plan was to deal with it. And here, was it successful or not? All right. So I build this knowledge repository for my first project. Then I build it for the second project and the third project. And then I keep this with me, right? I keep this with me for the next five years. I keep building it. Because as I say to people, when I, when I talk to them, I said, um, uh, can you remember, tell me, what did you have for dinner uh, three weeks ago on Wednesday night? I have no clue, right? Yes. Now let's talk about the project data. Remember that issue you had? Maybe you've captured it in an Excel spreadsheet, but now you can do searches and finds on it. And so a project manager can build up their own knowledge repository. This is what organizations are doing for reinforcement learning now for organizations that want to you know, build up their databases for, for projects. Uh, but a project manager can create their own. And imagine an organization that has you know, five project managers that do this and they keep this going for five years. And maybe you have 10 project managers. Imagine the knowledge repository 
from 10 project managers, having worked for 10 years on projects and maybe five or 10 projects per year. Isn't that of some value to you? Absolutely. So we don't, we don't need to um, you know, eliminate the project manager. We need to collaborate. And that's what I say at the end of the book. And part of that collaboration is these project managers who understand what the project agent is doing are going to be way, way ahead of the game, well prepared yeah. to adopt AI tools as they come into that project environment and change the project methodology. Absolutely. And if I, if you had one prediction, and I, I know this wasn't in our scope to talk about today, but just one prediction for how methodology will improve, um, you know, and may morph as a result of this technology, do, do you have any insights or, or perspectives coming from your crystal ball? <laughs> well, from my crystal ball, as I said, what's going to happen is um, uh, we're going to have a customized process. We're going to have a customized methodology and, and it won't be a customized methodology for an organization or a project type that is that is static. It's going to be dynamic because as we move along in this history of the world, things change. We know things yeah. change. So we will change with it. Um, and what's going to happen with project managers is they need to know a little bit more about statistics. You don't need a degree in mathematics, but you need to know a little bit more about math and statistics because that's what AI is based on, math and statistics. You need to know um, how to interpret AI results. So a probability of 95%, well, that's pretty easy. Things are looking good. What about a probability of 60%? What do you do? What do you do? So you have to think about it. Okay, um, maybe go back and look at my data, do some feature engineering. Uh, maybe my data is not accurate. Um, you know, maybe this isn't the right, uh, this isn't the right tool to use. Maybe I should do, be doing clustering. So project managers need to understand all these areas. I think this is what's going to happen with the, with the methodology is that we won't have this static type of methodology that people say, here's how to do communication, go do it forever. No, no, no. Because as soon as they say that a month later, it changes, right? Mm. You know, all of a sudden we've got WhatsApp and, and uh, you know, instant messaging and, and all those other tools. So things change and we will be on this constant uh, um, road to adopting, um, bringing in AI technology into our processes so that they can keep pace with what's going on in the external environment and with people skills. That's amazing. Well, what an amazing time I have had with you today. I am so very, very thankful. I'm just going to head back to our presentation. Um, so thank you so much um, to Paul for joining us today. And once again, if you would like to purchase any of Paul's books um, on the applications of AI and machine learning in project management, um, which I recommend you do, Amazon is your friend. I purchased my copies and received them um, within the mail, you know, in the mail in, the, in a week. And they've been a wonderful read with real life examples about how AI and machine learning can be applied. And thank you again for your time today, Paul. It has been absolutely lovely getting to know you, learning more about um, what you do and your expertise in this area. Uh, it's just been absolutely invaluable to me. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, Daniela. It was my pleasure. Not a problem. Take care. Bye, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye.